as we're exposed to something, we like it more and more up until a point. It's like when a new song comes out, the first time you listen to it, it was like, okay. The second time you're like, yeah, this is my jam. The third time you're like, damn, this is good. Then the eighth time you're like, ah, oh, I downvote, not on my playlist anymore. And so the result of this is that there's this really interesting bell-shaped curve, I call it the creative curve, where the more you're exposed to something, the more you like it up until a point, and then you like it less and less. And so what creatives are really good at doing is creating ideas that are the right part of that curve. They're not too new, but they're that right balance of familiar and different. Hey, everybody, welcome to episode 92 of the Andrew Deitch Podcast. If this is your first time listening to the show, I really just want to thank you so much for checking it out. It really means the world to me that you chose to listen. Hope you stick around, but in case you don't know, my show is all about having meaningful conversations with people who are changing the world, and today is no different. So last year, um, during the month of June, I released uh, 20 episodes, and a year later, I have uploaded a grand total of two episodes, so we're doing really well. Only uh, 10 times less than last year. <laughs> but um, seriously, this week I hit a major technical speed bump as far as the podcast goes, where I was limited to the number of episodes I could post. So hopefully I will be able to fix that this weekend. I figured out a temporary workaround for now, but everything will be back to normal on Monday and I can resume posting regularly. But normally this is where I would do a sponsored section of the podcast where I would share from one of our amazing sponsors that keeps the show afloat. But today it is on the house from me to you. But if you are interested in sponsoring this show, you can visit andrewdeitch.com slash contact and get in touch with us there. I've got a lot of exciting sponsorship opportunities lined up with some brands and some people that I really believe in. So definitely keep your eyes and ears peeled. But on the last episode of the podcast, I said that it would be Chad Buchanan as my guest, but I tricked you. (laughs) Actually, honestly, I just forgot that I was launching this podcast at a later date. We recorded it a little while ago. Um, But my guest today is Alan Gannett. He's the founder and CEO of a company called Track Maven, and he's also the author of the new book, The Creative Curve. And Track Maven is a marketing analytics firm. Um, They've had clients including Microsoft, Marriott, Saks Fifth Ave, Home Depot, Honda, GE. Alan's been on the 30 under 30 list for both Inc. and Forbes. So needless to say, he's got some credibility, but his new book, The Creative Curve, is all about overturning the mythology around creative genius. And in his book, he reveals the science and secrets behind achieving breakout commercial success in any field. A lot of people, I think, just believe that creativity is something that you're born with. But in the book, Alan breaks it down and shows us that there's a way that you can actually tap into that creativity inside everyone. And Alan lives in DC, but he was down in Atlanta to give a TEDx talk at Georgia Tech, which is really cool. So we were able to do a meetup and do a short little podcast. It was awesome. And I hope you guys enjoy it. So without any further delay... Please give it up for Alan Gannett. All right, everybody, I'm here with Alan Gannett. I'm in, and your your Twitter name. I just have to say this right off the bat. It's just at Alan. It is. How did you get that? <laughs> it's the long story. There's someone who's dead because of it. I really, you know, we can't we can't get gotcha. too far into it without you know pleading the fifth. Very very cool. Well, just to give people some context, we're sitting in the speaker room of a. Uh, of the Georgia Tech Historical Medicine The Academy building? of Medicine, I think. Something like yeah. that. Because uh, Brian, or Alan, excuse me, just uh, finished his TED Talk, yeah. TEDx Talk, which was pretty awesome. I got to watch the replay. It was awesome. <laughs> I unfortunately didn't make it to the actual... Classic slacker. I know, I know. But um, you talked about creativity. That's what your new book is about, right? Yeah. So tell us about your, your new book. What's it called and all that kind of stuff? So the book comes out June 12th. It's called The Creative Curve. And it's all about how anyone can learn to have moments of creative brilliance. And so basically, the book's broken into two halves. The first half is talking about the sort of popular Western notion of creativity, which I call the inspiration theory of creativity, which is this idea that creativity is for these sort of individual manic geniuses who are overwhelmed with inspiration. And we think about the Steve Jobs, the Elon Musk, and the J.K. Rowlings. And that's actually not true. And so the first half of the book is explaining the science that shows why that isn't true and why creativity is actually much more of a skill, something you can learn and enhance and improve on. 
In the second part of the book is I interviewed about 25 living creative geniuses. We're talking billionaires, Oscar winners, Michelin starred chefs, like a very eclectic mix of sort of modern genius. And I interviewed them about their creative process and I found these four things that all of them did to actually enhance their creativity. And so I break down those four things and I explain the science of why those work. So it's a very sort of actionable, uh, but still descriptive book about creativity and how to get better at it. Interesting. And you got into this subject because you're also the CEO of Track Maven. Yeah. So, which... I, so I run a marketing analytics company. So we work with a lot of big brands. The company's about five and a half years old. We work with a lot of big brands to help them tell stories from their data. So we'll suck in all their data. We'll help them understand what topics are resonating, what channels are resonating, which audiences are resonating, and so that they can actually focus on being creative and not having to somehow learn how to be data scientists. Like that's what we do for mm. them. And so the book really came about because you know I was spending so much time with marketers and marketers are supposed to be the most creative part of the organization, but they all are having this like, you know, stop before they start phenomenon where they're like, well, I wasn't, you know, I'm not that creative. So I have to like hire an agency or do all this stuff. And I was mm. like, well, creativity is not static. They're like, well, I wasn't born with it. And I'm like, but that's not actually how it works. And so originally this book started a few years ago as I was giving a talk to marketers about how creativity is a learned skill, not just uh, sort of a you know, divine given born thing. And that really resonated. And so I started working on a book about it and that eventually morphed into more of a like, every creative could benefit from this. So the book broadened a little bit. That's awesome. Yeah, because I feel like a lot of people have that tendency, especially when they're born, kind of like they'll, they'll tend towards art or whatever and their parents are like, oh, you're so creative. Yeah. And they, they associate it as like a character trait rather totally. than like a skill that they could get better at. 100%. And that's one of the things that, you know, we sort of mistake when, you know, there's a, the story of Mozart and you know, Mozart, we sort of think of as this, you know, child prodigy. But the reality was when he was three years old, his dad was probably the equivalent of what we call a helicopter parent today was like, you are going to learn to be a famous musician and you're going to practice three hours every single day with the world's best teachers or I won't love you. It's essentially what he said. <laughs> and so under the conditional love of his father, he practiced literally for hours a day. He wrote his first true original piece of music when he was 17. And like, I wasn't very good. And so like the idea that Mozart was like born, and like popped out of the womb and was creating amazing songs is just like not true. Like after 14 years of practicing with the world's best teachers, you too would be pretty good at piano. Exactly. <laughs> I, I would have to agree. And I think... You're totally right. I think we look at this quote unquote like overnight success kind of stuff, but we don't look at the hours and days and weeks that they spent perfecting their craft yeah. before that. I mean, J.K. Rowling's a great example of someone who, you know, the sort of the modern myth of her, she had the idea for Harry Potter on a train, she started scribbling it on a napkin, and boom, she's a billionaire. The reality is, she had spent her whole childhood reading, so of course she fantasizes about like characters and plots and all this stuff. And then, uh, she was on a train, she had the idea for the characters, and then spent the next five years writing the first book. Like, this is not the story of, like, she was just overwhelmed with, like, you know, all of this inspiration. It just, like, poured out of her, and she wrote a book in, like, you know, five days. Like, that's not what happened. Exactly. That's, yeah, it, it definitely resonates with me, because as someone who... I, I tended towards art and stuff like that growing up, but I saw these kids that were, like, better than me, and so I just thought that they were born with it or something. Well, there's, there's, I think part of the notion, I talk about this in the book at the end, is that we not only use this um, to be sort of discouraged, but we also use it as an excuse to ourselves. Totally. I think where we say, well, it's not that easy for me, so like, I'm just not gonna try, like, I'm not that person, which is such a cop-out, because like, every, you, know, you are, like, any of the actual science that looks at this space shows us that like, you can develop extraordinary skill and talent in anything. Mm. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why in terms of how our brains work. But like the basic short of it is when they look at studies and they compare um, the correlation between IQ and creative potential, there's this phenomenon called the threshold theory, which is basically past a certain relatively average IQ, everyone has the same creative potential. Like you don't have to be a genius. You know, an Albert Einstein to also be creative. In fact, there's a really fascinating study done by Lewis Terman in the early part of the 19th century where he did an IQ test for all these kids and took all the kids with genius level IQs and was like, I'm going to follow them for the rest of their lives in a not so creepy way and <laughs> started sending them surveys every five years about their life and all this stuff. And what was interesting is he was actually doing it to prove a point that like geniuses weren't like crazy because at the time that was sort of a common notion was like people who are brilliant are also like crazy. 
And so he did prove that you know people with a high IQ were quote unquote normal in terms of like suicide, divorce, and alcoholism. But he also accidentally proved that they're very normal in success. Like there wasn't actually in that group of geniuses, there was people who you know were, worked in retail jobs and were blue collar, and there was actually no one who we would consider like a household like a Steve genius. Jobs or something. None. Yeah. In fact. Um, two, the only two Nobel laureates that he tested are two kids who he did not did not hit the threshold. And so, like, huh. what you find when you actually look at the hard sciences of this is that creativity. There's a lot of really good academic um, work done on creativity, all showing that you can get better at it. Yeah, definitely. And I think one thing that comes to my mind in creativity is sometimes you almost have to have a little bit of blind ignorance yeah. to put yourself out there, mm. like. To make a video or something, and if you're like overthinking it and you know just trying to be analy- overly analytical and like objectively, oh this sucks, you know, and you're you find yourself like a smart person, but yeah. you think your st- stuff sucks or whatever. Someone who is you know kind of quote unquote like dumber or whatever, like blissfully unaware that their stuff yeah. sucks, they could put it out there and other yeah. people might enjoy it. Beautifully ignorant. Exactly, yeah. exactly, and I think that's the case with a lot of you know artists. People are like, oh well, I could have done that, like modern artists. Yeah, and it's like, well, yeah, but you. You did it. And also it's different doing it now than doing it then. So one of the things I talk about in the book is that creativity is actually a social construct. So if I was talking to you and I said, I showed, you know, we pointed out a painting, and I said, is that creative? It's actually very hard for you to answer that question because if I just repainted the Mona Lisa and I was a particularly talented fine artist, like that wouldn't be creative. It would be skillful, Definitely. but it wouldn't actually be creative. And so one of the really important parts about creativity is that it sits in a certain time and place. And um, the key thing that academics when they talk about creativity is that people have to agree that it's creative. For something mm-hmm. to be creative, you actually have to get people to agree that it's creative since it's a social construct. Like some sort of originality? Well, so basically how, the, how like sociologists, psychologists define creativity, I actually think is a really good definition. They say things that are creative are the right combination of both they're novel and they're valuable. And so if you just create something that's novel, Mm, that's actually not that interesting. Like if I just throw paint against a wall, like this is novel. Now, value is a subjective thing. And value, like if I threw paint against a wall and it was, you know, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago and that had never been done before and that was this big sign of radical expression, well that actually carries a lot of value. But people have to agree. Like the art critics, the people who go to, they all have to agree that this is valuable. That's what mm-hmm. makes it valuable and that's what makes it creative. And so that's, I think, a really interesting aspect of creativity is how important timing is. And that's why I really like exploring creativity from the perspective of hits, because mainstream hits are things we all sort of have said are creative, like these are good. So like think about movies that win Oscars and you know, we see the King's speech and we're like, oh, that was like a good movie. Like we all sort of agree. Yeah. But the thing is that for something to be labeled creative, you just have to get some group of people to agree that it's valuable. So it could be like a really small group, like it could be you know the art critics in Brooklyn or something who say like this new up and coming artist is like super avant garde, um, or it can be like a mainstream hit. Like people have different definitions of creativity mm. and different ways that they assess it. Yeah, I, one thing that comes to my mind is like this. Uh, current phenomenon of like Supreme, the the brand, oh, the, the streetwear yeah, yeah, yeah. brand, how they can just put their name on everything. It's and creative, it's, and it's like it's yeah, it's like is it create like? But the value is perceived by this large group of people that are obsessed with Supreme well, that I, it is. I think one of the the most interesting things that's happened in creativity in the last few years, and I would put Supreme actually under this category, is memes. So yeah. basically, like with a meme, um, you get a lot of really interesting parts of creativity. So. One of the things I talk about in the book is that, this is a bit of a longer story, so is that what scientists have found is that human beings have these two conflicting urges. So we like things that are both familiar because we feel like they're safe. So we have some sort of like evolutionary limbic system appreciation for things that are safe, like they're not gonna kill us. But we also want things that are novel and we want, because maybe it's a potentially new source of food or rewards, mm-hmm. that's also like hardwired into us. And so these two things are in direct contradiction to each other. And the result of this is that we're constantly looking for things that are at the right balance of familiarity and novelty. So if we see a red hmm. berry you know, in a field and it looks way too different than anything we've ever seen before, we go, oh, this is probably dangerous. If it kind of looks like a strawberry, but a little bit different, we're like, oh, I should probably try it. It might be a new source of food hmm. for me. 
So what they find is that this is actually the underlying psychology of what powers trends. Because as we're exposed to something, we like it more and more up until a point. So you can think about this with songs, like when a new song comes out. The first time you listen to it, oftentimes you're like, eh, it was like, okay. The second time you're like, yeah, this is my jam. The third time you're like, damn, this is good. Then the eighth time you're like, ah, oh, like, you know, downvote, not on my playlist anymore. And so the result of this is that there's this really interesting bell-shaped curve. I call it the creative curve, where the more you're exposed to something, the more you like it up until a point, and then mm. you like it less and less. And so what creatives are really good at doing is they're really good at creating ideas that the right part of that curve, that are about to go up quickly, that are not too overdone or they're not too new, mm. but they're that right balance of familiar and different. And so back to the point around the memes, memes are really powerful as a creativity tool because they have that like that familiar structure and box. Like think about mm -hmm. Grumpy Cat. It's a picture of a grumpy cat. The first line is something really normal and basic. And the second line is something grumpy. And so it's really straightforward to add just that little bit of novelty by adding your own perspective to actually make something that's creative because people are like, oh, I get it. It's a little bit different and it's interesting and it engages me because I'm like in on the joke. Yeah. And so memes have been a really interesting way. You've seen so many more people engage in creativity because it's such a low barrier to entry. Like everyone knows the structure of a certain meme. It's very easy then to fill that structure in with your own novel twist. Yeah. I think that's kind of what happened with Vine. Like, oh, totally. Like everyone realized this new format and they realized like, okay, I can fit like three or four little scenes in here and I'm just going to reenact some sort of like relatable scene or whatever. Totally. And um, this is what's so interesting, the whole thing with the Supreme is that it's basically a meme. I mean, um, you know, one person that I talked to about creativity who you know didn't want to be named on this one um, <laughs> told me that thought it was really fascinating is that you know, Obama was the first meme president. When you think about like the Hope poster and how everyone was like redoing their profiles to that sort of design, that was like printed everywhere and all the stuff, but we didn't really acknowledge it. Trump was actually the first meme president that we acknowledged because very true. he was wearing, you know, the Make America Great Again hats are actually like amazing if you think about the Instagram generation. It's all these people and it's spreading, it's this message and like, and so he used this sort of like mimetic way of communicating that was very spreadable. And so memes are like just like one of the most fascinating things to come out of internet culture because they're so um, decentralized. Yeah, definitely. I would have to agree because I've actually listened to a podcast where they're talking about the meme ability of Drake. Oh, like how yeah. Psychologically, he's created so many amazing memes just based on how he puts content out there. Like the one album cover, he's sitting on the edge of the thing. Obviously, people are going to re-photoshop that onto a million things. And he wants that. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And, he, and he, like, does he purposefully dance kind of bad so that people make fun of him? Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. I think so. I mean, I, I think, think so I too. Think one of the things I found really interesting when I was interviewing all these like famous creative people was like, they're all like pretty intentional. Like, I think you know, we as sort of like consumers of content, we're like, oh, like this person's so organic. Like, I always think the best example is like a stand-up comedian. Like, you go to a stand-up mm. comedian like a show. And like they're sort of trying to like play as if they're organic and doing all this stuff. But in reality, like stand-up comedy is one of the most like aggressively like written and rewritten activities. Like there's this scene in the newest um, Jerry Seinfeld special on Netflix where he's sitting in the middle of a courtyard and there's all of the papers around him of every joke he's ever written, right? Hmm. And these guys, they just write and they write and they write. And then they go to like these underground mic nights, like try jokes out and like work them out and like see it. And like by the time it's actually in a special, like every pause, every like facial expression has been like worked out and thought through. But we as consumers are like, oh, it's this like organic thing. And it's like, no, no, no. Like these guys know exactly what they're doing. Yeah, and that's why they don't put out specials like every week. No, you can't. They cannot. I mean, and a lot you gotta of- You gotta work out the jokes. A lot of comedians, you know, the thing they do is they basically sort of run some sort of cadence. Like, you know, they'll do a year of touring, a year of new jokes. They do a special with all those jokes. They retire all those jokes and they go back to scratch. Yeah, and if you don't retire all the jokes, people are going to show up like, "What the hell? I already yeah, saw I've, this on Netflix." I've heard this. Yeah, yeah, and it's yeah, exactly. You don't you don't want to do that. So, what you're saying is a lot of creative people. You think on the outside, the the perspective from most people is like, "Oh, they just come up with all this stuff just off the top of their head." They're and it's so not, brilliant. Yeah, they're so brilliant. Like uh, I know you talked about Casey Neistat before. Yeah. Like 
I know that uh, recently he started Twitch streaming and he's kind of started talking about his creative process and how he's more intentional than you actually Someone think. Someone just mentioned this to me. I, I want to watch it now. Someone literally mentioned this to me like 20 minutes ago. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, and he's, I think he's done like 10 streams or so. And cool. like what he's, his new project, not to make the whole thing about Casey Neistat, but uh, he started this new daily vlog that he's doing and he's starting to like, once he launches the episode in the morning, he'll go live on Twitch later so that he can have audience engagement, That's talk cool. about how, like the kind of behind the scenes. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, I interviewed Casey for the book and we talked a lot about um, creative community. So I have a chapter on communities. Because one of the things I think is interesting is that since creativity is a social construct, there's a really big element of like other people. So like you need other people to recognize you as creative in order to actually be creative. Because mm. if no one's ever heard of you, like how do you actually determine whether or not someone's creative? And so you see this a lot with like, in a lot of industries, like mentors, you see a lot with like, a really experienced producer in Hollywood may work with like a really up and coming director who has fresh ideas. That doesn't just benefit the person with fresh ideas, it also benefits the producer because if creativity comes at the intersection of familiarity and novelty, like you need those new ideas to mm. keep your career going. And so that's one of the biggest differences between you know a one hit wonder and a consistently best selling musician is that the one hit wonder doesn't change and adapt versus the constantly selling musician. Think about the Beatles and how they constantly were changing their style mm -hmm. to not tire out their audience. And yeah. that's what made them so impressive. Exactly. And I, I think that about that a lot when I'm at concerts. I'm like watching, I'm like, what would my great great grandma think about this? You know, like they would just think it's utter trash, just yeah. noise. Yeah. Like imagine going to a, like a dubstep show or something and bringing like a pilgrim or something totally. like that. It would just be, they, they, they would not even jump so many steps. Exactly. And there's all these really fascinating <laughs> studies. There's like this field called empirical musicology, which is basically like the math of music. There's all these really interesting studies that look at, and again, they follow a bell-shaped curve of how different features in music are used. And they follow this bell-shaped curve because they go in and out of style. Mm -hmm. And so like even with classical music, like the tempos and the arrangements and the things people use, like they hear it, they find it interesting, they reuse it, they repurpose it, and then eventually they realize if they're savvy that their audience is getting tired of it mm. and they move on. Yeah. And so that I think is like, just like really, it's really interesting to me that like we go through these very obvious trends and yet as consumers, I think we are sort of loath to admit that there's some sort of bigger external forces mm. pushing our preferences and interests. Definitely. And one person in particular that I know you're a large fan of, Taylor Swift. Oh, the best. She's definitely T been- T-Swift, I'm seeing her July 10th. <laughs> she's definitely adapted a lot. Oh yeah, and it's, but think about it, if she was still doing you know, country music, like she wouldn't be the mega star that she is today. Like she is now like, you know, basically, you know, she's a Madonna-esque, you know, pop, yeah. permanent pop Top picture. Yeah, and, um, but she's done a great job of this and sort of, I remember one of her albums, I know a lot about Taylor Swift, you know, it was right when Dubstep was coming out and she had that song, The Name's Escaping Me, that had this sort of like Dubstep background beat and like, she's not doing that anymore. You know, like she's very savvy to moving the trends, in and out of these trends and, but some people call it a sellout. You know, they're like, oh, look at Taylor Swift. She's abandoning her her country girl roots. She's just trying to become a pop star and all this. And I think the sort of interesting thing for me is like, you know, why anyone who's create creative ultimately wants an audience. Like, otherwise, like there is like the people who just create stuff and put it in their garage are honestly rare and few between. They at least want their friends or family to acknowledge them. Mm. And so I think that's actually a really big part of creativity is wanting to entertain and like create something for others to share. And so I actually feel pretty strongly that uh, popular culture, whether that's pop music or pop movies or any of these things are actually really creative because you think about, we often in hindsight feel that they're creative. Like the Beatles when they first came out, like we'd all say the Beatles are creative now, the Beatles, when they first came out, we were like, oh, like this is like, you know, pop music trash and like blah, blah, blah. And like, this is not creative, it's just racket. <laughs> and so I think, I think we generally forget that the things that are really popular now are the things that 40, 50 years from now are the things we'll have labeled creative. Yeah, kind of like these new like mumble rappers or whatever. Yeah. Like obviously people are listening to them for a reason. They're yeah. doing something totally different. Yeah. Call it trash, call it whatever. I, but I like it. Yeah, I, I mean, listen hey. to everything. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so you talked about how the book is kind of split into two parts. The, like the beginning, you said it was kind of this um, debunking kind of, the myth. Exactly. And then what? What's the second part? So the second part is I explain the four things that these creatives all did that enhanced their creativity. And so, um, 
by the way, it's so funny. I was doing an interview the other day and I somehow like forgot the fourth one. Like I had a Rick Perry <laughs> moment and I was like, oh my God, like this is, I've literally spent like years on this. Like I was just, I was like, I hope I'm just really tired. So <laughs> let's make sure I don't do that again. But the four are consumption, imitation, community, and iterations. We got them. Oh, geez. Um, basically, um, the sort of short version, because they're each, they're each like a pretty long section of the book. Um, the first one is that consumption which I talk about the reason, the ways that you can actually learn to have more flashes of genius, those sort of aha moments that we think are so magical and special. I talk about how you can actually, through a certain type of consumption, actually have more of those. Mm. And by co consumption, I mean content consumption. Um, then I talk about imitation. So you know, one of the things I talked about with like memes or any of these things is that um, familiarity is really important to creativity. Yeah, and if so, you're not in the know, you can't create a meme. Yeah, exactly. And so familiarity is really important. So the way that people do that is we use all sorts of structures and formulas. So like a soap opera or a sitcom has three acts and they have commercial breaks between each one. You know, pop songs are typically you know, about three minutes. And typically one thing, like this is a fun fact about pop songs, like you know, a little, little inside scoop. One of the big things to structure a pop song is you use elements of the chorus very early on in the song because we like repeatability. So if we've already heard it, we like it more the second time we've heard it. So oftentimes in a song, you'll hear like a riff or a refrain from the future chorus very early on in the song. Mm. That's all a structure. So if you're a creative, you have to learn those things if you want to have the highest probability of success. So one of the most common things people do is a lot of these creatives imitate very heavily. So they'll look at other people in their field who have done stuff and they'll actually work on figuring out, like working reverse engineering the structure. Like there's a lot of stories of famous novelists who would like outline books they really like to understand like hmm. how the story developed. The third one is community. So, you know, if you're a creative, since it's a social construct, the role of other people are really big in this. We talked a little about that. And the last one is iterations. So one of the ideas I think is the most dangerous in creativity is that people have this idea like, oh, you come up with an idea and you're done because you get brilliant inspiration and blah, blah, Oh my God, this is so not true. So like, you know, Mozart, they sort of say like, oh, he would just like write music and like it would just flow out of him. And there's this letter where he talks about being able to like see music. That letter was literally a forgery. There was a music publisher named Rochlitz, Rochlitz, and he was like this big Mozart fanatic. He was sort of like a thought leader of Mozart in the 1800s. Like mm. people, he liked, liked to pump up Mozart. He's a fanboy. Yeah, he's a fanboy. He just forged this letter. And so <laughs> if you actually look at Mozart's letters, he talks about how hard it was to write music and how like if you look at some of his original drafts, like there's tons of like scribbles and changes and all this stuff. And so the notion that you know, creativity for the select few people just flows out of them. It's just completely not true. I mean, J.K. Rowling literally took five years to write her first book, right? And so I think that's a really dangerous belief that people have. And so in the book, I talk about the iterative processes that creatives go through. Um, you know, I talk about how a lot of people use data in that process. I talk about the Ben and Jerry's flavor team and how they use data to inform their new flavors, actually. And wow. so. And so that's one of the things that is a big, I hope is a big takeaway from the book is that, you know, you need to go through cycles of feedback and iteration mm -hmm. and all that stuff. So the community, not only like surrounding yourself with other creative people, but giving it to a community so that they can respond and react. Yeah. So there's a, a few different elements in a community. I mean, some of the ones I think are really important is obviously there's like um, collaborators. So, and the thing with collaborators are you don't want people similar to you. You want people that are very different. So hmm. you want people that fill in your weaknesses. And so oftentimes people are like, oh, like I can't be you know, a successful musician. I'm not organized enough. Well, like a lot of successful musicians have like a songwriting partner or a producer or someone who helps them actually like buttress that weakness and actually make it better and actually make them be able to like get through that. That's a really important one. I talk about the role of a promoter. So in creativity, since it's a social construct, you have to have people actually hear about what you're doing and you need someone else to like lend it credibility. So this is where you often see like more senior and experienced people like leaning in and saying like, this person is good, right? Yeah, and um, that's very true. Like Usher did like Justin Bieber or something oh, like that. Oh, 100%, yeah. right? And um, now Justin Bieber did it with Carly Rae Jepsen, right? Yeah. And like yeah. now she's huge and like, yeah. and sort of, you know, um, Rascal Flatts put Taylor Swift on their tour many years ago. 
And then she became big, and then Taylor Swift put Shawn Mendes on her tour a few years ago, and now he's big. You know what I mean? Like, that's actually a really big part of the creative process. Definitely. Um, so. Because you got to get that social proof from your idol. So you're like, oh, well, if Taylor likes this guy, then I have to like this yeah, guy. Exactly. Or else am I a real Taylor fan. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah, and I think another thing that Team really... Team Taylor. Yeah, Team Taylor, Team Taylor, course. all the way. Hey, I'll, I'll, I'll be on Team Taylor today okay, good, for sure. Good. I've never been not on Team Taylor, I guess. You're just but pretending you're not. Yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah, it's okay. No, but um, I definitely feel like uh, someone, another example, like Dr. Dre, people will talk about like his original album, like the one that kind of popped off. I don't even remember exactly what it was, but it wasn't even that much of him. It was a lot of features and a lot of collaborators totally. and stuff that people were like, oh, snap, this is amazing. Or, you know, people do that now, like DJ Khaled and all these people, like they're yes. very feature-driven and like... I mean, that's such a huge part of pop culture is the sort of the, the remixing, the mashing, the collaboration that like, I don't know, did you just see that um, video that was it Lil Dicky Lil, and Chris I, Brown? I, I, dude, I was just thinking when you when you said the repeatability <laughs> of a song, I was like, that song has been on repeat for oh, me. Oh, but I just, I was watch I watched it last night for the first time. I just thought it was so, su such an interesting, if you haven't seen it, it's basically there's this rapper, Lil Dicky, and um, he has this video uh, called Freaky Friday, where he basically swaps bodies with Chris Brown and other celebrities. And it's just so, and the song's catchy, but it's just so, like, there's all this social proof, and it's funny, and it's self-aware, and it's knowing. And it's, like, it's completely ridiculous, but as someone who's interested in creativity as, like, um, a, like a more academic topic, it's actually a really great example of culture. Yes. And how things come together to form something new. I think it's safe to say it's my favorite music video ever. <laughs> like, I'm serious. I, I, I think I watched it at least 25 it's times. It's kind of amazing. It's amazing. The f and, like, you believe Chris Brown. Yes. You believe yes. him. He's, like, one of the best actors in that video. Yeah. He, you know, he's just so psyched and so happy <laughs> that he's Chris Brown. It's, it's, it's absolutely amazing. But... Um, yeah, if you haven't watched it, it's you definitely, worth watching. It is worth watching. Yeah. I'm telling you, it's an intellectual exercise, so it you really have is. permission. And even even with all the the cursing and everything, I still recommended it to my parents. My parents loved it. Yeah. So there you, you go. Know what? It, and and all the penis jokes. I, <laughs> it was still it was still great. Still academic. Yeah. yeah. The, the end is like slightly cringeworthy. Yeah. Like a like a little bit. Yeah. Like just the very shut last it off. Line. Shut it off for the last 15 seconds. Exactly. Last 15 seconds. Shut it off. You'll be you'll, you'll be, be laughing. You'll, you'll be, be smiling. Fine. Yeah. Anyways, but um, another thing that I wanted to mention is I feel like a lot of times in my own creative process, I'm like so in a thing that I can't objectively like take a step back and look at it and say, is this good? You know, like if you're editing a picture for a long time or editing a video yeah. or something, it's hard to like watch it and be like seeing this it for is, the first time. Yeah, and the role I talk about this in the community chapter is the role of a teacher. And the teacher, mm. that's sort of a loose term, like it can be someone who gives you feedback, but in your creative process, you need people who are teaching you, giving you feedback, um, and hopefully, ideally, you're also finding ways to actually get feedback from your audience. So I talk a lot about how in um, Hollywood, I don't think people realize right now how much data is used to create a movie in terms of, oftentimes for big movies, they're actually doing testing and surveying just on the concept of the movie to see if it's gonna resonate. Hmm. Um, they're doing tons of pre-screenings to understand like which characters are resonating, is the ending working? You know, Fatal Traction, which was this huge successful movie, it's actually a completely different ending that was originally written because the test audiences hated the ending. Hmm. And they changed it and it worked. They won you know, Academy Award, they, it was a huge box office success. And then not only when they're making the movie, but they test all the trailers, all the variations, and then they actually do basically the equivalent of like political polling, it's called tracking, and they actually survey American consumers to see which movies they're gonna watch. So that if a certain demographic is not saying yes, they can still pivot their marketing strategy to get that demographic more excited about the movie. Yeah. And so heard, it's like, this stuff is so data-driven. Yeah, I heard that Suicide Squad, they did that, where they like released the trailer, it was like, it blew up, everyone was so excited, and they actually, they contracted the like trailer company who made the trailer to go and like re-edit the whole movie. Oh wow, interesting. And that's why it kind of felt kind of disjointed a little bit and like Jared Leto's Joker was supposed to be a way bigger character and then he was only in like two scenes or oh, whatever. Oh interesting. Yeah, it was really, really odd but I personally didn't like the movie but it was interesting because the trailer got so much traction, everyone yeah. loved the trailer so much that they just felt like, okay, we, we've got to make the yeah. movie exactly it like the trailer. It sounds like they messed it up that point but a yeah. definitely, the hit rate's not going to be 100%. Of course, of course. Well, I feel I know we don't have very much time. We've been talking for about thirty minutes. Um, what else do people need to know about your book? All that kind of stuff. Um, it's called the Creative Curve. CreativeCurve.com. There's you can you know read the preface. There's links galore. It comes out June twelfth. Everywhere books are sold, 
And, um, and who, like, what audience did you write this for? I know you said he kind of, it originally was for marketers a, and then it kind of Any aspiring into- creative. So I think anyone who wants to be creative, whether you're an artist, an entrepreneur, or a marketer, like it has really actionable applications to all those fields. That's awesome. So. I think books are the best place for actionable stuff. Because yeah. you can reread it, you can write stuff yeah, down, you can make notes. Yeah, it notes, like it's great. It's yeah. awesome, man. Well, very cool. Thanks for uh, making time on this busy, busy day. Thanks for having me. And um, we'll, we'll and, and, and also, where can people find you? I already mentioned that you're Alan on Twitter. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Alan.xyz is the URL. And so my blog, you sign up for the newsletter, follow me on all the socials. All Here the socials. Go. Yes, that's awesome. Go to his website and uh, check it out. Bye. All right, see you, everybody. Boom. There you go. Thank you guys so much for listening. Thanks again to Alan for being a guest on the show. Again, make sure you guys go follow him on Instagram and all that fun stuff. His handles are extremely easy to find. He's like at Alan on a bunch of things. But um, make sure you go snag his book, The Creative Curve. It is out now. Uh, I will have the links to everything in the description. But okay, you made it to the end. You're in the club. That means a lot of things. But number one, that means that you enjoyed this podcast. And that's a really good thing because I know that you'll love some of my other episodes as well. And first, I know that you'll enjoy going back to listen to episode 88 with Andrew Deitch podcast veteran and my good friend Austin Distel. He recently moved to Austin, Texas, um, but a lot has happened in the past year for him. Earlier this year, he moved from Annapolis, Maryland to Silicon Valley with his company Proof to go through the famous seed accelerator Y Combinator. And... That was a three-month process that culminated in Demo Day when all the startups present their companies to a carefully selected invite-only audience. And on that episode, he shared the story of how they reached their funding goal in just 72 hours after their two-minute pitch on Demo Day. Crazy story. If you're into entrepreneurship, technology, or startups, you will love that episode. That was episode 88. And also, I have a feeling that you'll really enjoy going back to listen to episode 56 with George Yu. And actually, Austin and George worked together on the launch of George's company, Wind Pouch. You've probably seen them before. They're like those little inflatable hammocks. But George was actually asked to be on Shark Tank. He got chosen by Mark Cuban for 20% of his company for half a million dollars. So I think it's safe to say that George is doing pretty big things. He told me all about his experience at Shark Tank and all kinds of other fun stuff as well. I think you guys will really enjoy that episode if you haven't listened. Again, that was episode 56 with George Yu. Coming up next, we have episode 93 with my friend Chad Buchanan. Talk about a freaking beast. When you see Chad, you would definitely have no problem believing that he used to be the face of Abercrombie. He was on all the bags, and he was the guy when you walk in the stores, you would see him. Um, But besides just being another pretty face, he's actually an amazing actor and very successful entrepreneur. As a kid, he was an amazing athlete. He held numerous state swimming and wrestling records. He was a quarterback on his high school football team. And also, did I mention that he was a professional gamer? Yeah, like video games. So (laughs) during his senior year in high school, he convinced his mom to give him his college savings to pursue a business that created gaming hardware and peripherals. And then after dropping out of high school... And in the midst of launching that gaming company, he moved to New York City to pursue his career in modeling. And after a lot of hard work, he landed a ton of international campaigns with Abercrombie, Calvin Klein, Versace, and a bunch more. And after traveling all over the world as a model, he decided that he wanted to pursue a career in acting. So he moved to L.A., And now he's best known for his roles as Hunter Morgan on the TV show Star. Um, Also, he's been on Jane the Virgin, Grey's Anatomy, and Glee. And also, he recently joined the cast of Marvel's Inhumans. Uh, We recorded that episode in LA. It was an absolute blast, and I'm glad to call Chad a friend. So, um, provided I can figure out my technical difficulties, that episode will be coming out early next week. So, definitely don't miss it. If you want to support the show, go to my... uh, iTunes page. iTunes just so happens to be the number one place where people um, can rate and review podcasts and find podcasts. So if you can go leave me a five-star review there, that would be super, super helpful. Also, if you want to follow me, you can go to my website, andrewdeitch.com. That's Andrew andrewdeitch.com. You can find the links to all of my social media handles and accounts. Also, I've been posting a lot of YouTube videos recently. So if you want to go on YouTube, you can find my videos there. And that's pretty much it. Thank you guys for supporting the show. Thanks for listening. And I will see you guys next week. Oh, the best. T-Swift. I'm seeing her July 10th.